your perceptions are biased by your temperament and they have to be because well, because you have to screen things, and so you screen things in accordance with your temperament. You know, you're oriented towards certain things in the world, certain values, for example. And that's, a perfectly, that's perfectly reasonable, because you can't do everything at once anyways, <clears throat> so there's no reason for you not to be directional. The question is, what are the pathologies associated with directionality? Now, <clears throat> conscientiousness is a very interesting... Um, uh, trait in relationship to that because there are obvious benefits to being conscientious, right? I mean, it's the best long-term predictor of job uh, performance, for example, and, and I'll outline some other data. That might be more associated with industriousness than orderliness, but there's utility to orderliness as well, um, and, and we'll cover that in detail today. The question is, <clears throat> no, the issue is that you never get a benefit without a price. And so you can see that with agreeableness. If you're agreeable, high in agreeableness, then you're compassionate and polite and you're empathic and you can work well in teams, but the price you pay for that is that you don't negotiate very well on your own behalf and that you can be easily taken advantage of. And then if you're very low in agreeableness, well, then you're more competitive and more out to win, I would say, but the price you pay for that is that if you become too disagreeable, then you're likely to be sufficiently antisocial, let's say, so that you might end up in prison. So... You don't get a cost without a benefit. You don't get a benefit without a cost. So then the question might be, well, what's up with conscientiousness? Because it seems, all things considered, that it would be a good thing to be conscientious. Now, I can think of some exceptions to that. So, conscientious people are dutiful, industrious, orderly, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and they tend to sacrifice the present for the future. And that's a good thing. So you, you, you save up, let's say you save up wealth, you save up labor and effort for the future. You know, uh, don't live for today. Don't be impulsive. Work hard and all that. That'll accrue you success over the long run. The downside of that is <clears throat> the long run has to be stable in order for that to be a reasonable strategy. And so conscientiousness is not a good strategy at least under some conditions, in situations that are radically unstable. Because in situations that are radically unstable, you might as well get what you can now. Or that's one way of looking at it anyways. The other thing about being conscientious, if you store up wealth, say, as a consequence of hard work, then that can make you targets for people who would like to come and take your wealth. And so um, it, it's also one of the things that happened to many people in the 20th century, most recently in, in Venezuela, is that let's say you're conscientious and you save money. Well, what happens in a period of hyperinflation? Well, your money's wiped out. And so, you know, this happened to Germany, say, in the 1920s. And you've got to understand what hyperinflation does to a society because <clears throat> what hyperinflation does is destroy the people who worked hardest to construct the society because they're the people who've been pr prudent and careful and sacrificed and so forth. And then when a period of high inflation comes along, poof, everything they have disappears. And that happened in Germany during the 1920s. Now, there was a bunch of reasons for that, but... So Germany was very unstable in the 1920s, right? Because of the war had just ended. They, they had um, been subjected to the Versailles Treaty, which was a very punitive treaty aimed against Germany. It's not like the Allies had lacked reasons to impose a punitive treaty, but nonetheless, they did. Germany lost a lot of territory, including their industrial, uh, in, including their industrial areas. Germany was flooded by men who were brutalized in the trenches in World War I. I mean, you could hardly imagine how terrible trench warfare is, and you can't imagine what you'd be like after a month of that, a day of that, let alone a couple of years of that. And then Germany underwent a period of hyperinflation. At the same time, in the Soviet Union, the Commun Communist Revolution had, had been successful, and so there was tremendous political upheaval in Germany during the 1920s as well. I, I want to just set the stage for that. And so... But the hyperinflation wiped out all the people that were prudent and saved and left them with a terrible sense that the entire system had betrayed them, which is, of course, exactly what had happened. Thank you.